There was a vital part of her life here. The piano, the organ, singing, teaching, accompanying, drafting the church choir. All these skills were taught and brought her so much joy. Just as she gave us much joy by sharing her talents with us. Whose taste in music encompassed a wide variety of genres. But her favorite music to sing was the Lutheran Chorus. These rich Lutheran hymns convict us with the law, comfort us with the gospel, and cheer us with a certain hope of heaven. One week ago today, we had the opportunity to meet with the current popular choral composer. At the end of the interview, Ruth boldly proclaimed the gospel, saying, Do you believe that Jesus has died for you and taken away your sins? That we will see each other again in heaven. The state is a faithful truth for us. We can take comfort on this difficult day and the fact that the pain of this world is only transitory. Ruth is now celebrating her victory in Christ in heaven, where the music she loved here on earth is perfected 
speaking through his prophet Isaiah, Christ says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve and die, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair.
we have come together to seek God's comfort in our sorrow and to rejoice in the promise of the resurrection. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and mercy, we give thanks for your loving kindness to all your servants who, having finished their course in faith, now rest from their labors. Grant that we also may be faithful unto death and receive the crown of eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. The first lesson this evening is recorded in the book of Joel in the 19th chapter, reading there verses 23 through 27. Oh, that my words were written, oh, that they were inscribed in a book, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Here ends the first lesson. Please join now in singing the 23rd Psalm that is written on page 177. <coughs> Christ, who is our life, appears, 
then we also will appear with him in glory. We will be before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Never again will we hunger. Never again will we thirst. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be our shepherd. He will lead us to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Let us pray. God of all grace, you sent your son Jesus to destroy the power of death and to open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we too shall live. Comfort us with your promise that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The second lesson is recorded in the eighth chapter, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning at verse 28. And we know that in all things, work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these also he called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God to that? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So far the epistle. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the 11th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, beginning at the 28th verse, where we read as follows in Jesus' name. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here ends the gospel. You may be seen.
Christopher Reed Wild was born on April 14, 1988, in Vero Beach, Florida, the only child of the Reverend John and Diane Falkenberg Wild. Her father baptized her into the Christian faith on April 24, 1988, at Trinity Lutheran Church, Sebastian, Florida. Her sponsors were William and Ruth Ebert of Watertown, Wisconsin. When Ruth was two years old, on June 7, 1990, the Lord took her father to heaven. He had suffered from stomach cancer. On June 21, 1991, Ruth was given a stepfather, the Reverend Theodore Gullickson. The family lived in Escondido, California for eight years. Reverend Gullickson adopted Ruth on April 6, 1994. Ruth attended Ascension Lutheran Elementary School from kindergarten to the beginning of seventh grade. She transferred to Starville Lutheran School for seventh and eighth grade when the family moved to Forest City, Iowa. Ruth made a public profession of her baptismal vows in May 2002 during a confirmation service at Forest Lutheran Church, Forest City. Ruth attended Luther High School on Alaska, Wisconsin Graduating in May 2006, she played clarinet in the high school band and was involved in several school plays. Ruth spent the next four years at Bethany Lutheran College, Mankato, graduating in May 2010 with a double major in English and Music. On June 18, 2010, Ruth was married to Paul Weber at Trinity Chapel, Mankato. The couple then lived in Mankato where Paul was attending Bethany Lutheran Theological Seminary. Ruth began to suffer from, from cancer in November of 2011 after three months of pregnancy. In January 2012, Ruth was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer. Her son, John Wild Weber, was born February 7, 2012 at Methodist Hospital, Rochester, Minnesota. John's grandfather, the Reverend David J. Weber, baptized him that same day. By God's grace, John does not have the gene that causes stomach cancer. Ruth continued with chemotherapy treatments until July. The treatments were stopped after they became ineffective and her cancer had spread. The Good Shepherd took her to heaven on September 30th, 2012 at her home in Mankato at the age of 24. Ruth is survived by her husband, Paul Weber, and son John of Mankato, her parents, Reverend Theodore and Diane Gullickson of Madison, Wisconsin. Her brothers, Mark Gullickson of Mankato and Paul Gullickson of Madison, Wisconsin. Her parents-in-law, Reverend David J. and Carol Weber of Scottsdale, Arizona. And many other relatives whose names appear on this bulletin insert. Ruth was preceded in death by her father, Reverend John Wilde, her grandparents, Francis and Catherine Wilde, her uncle David, and her grandfather, the Reverend Walter Gullickson. She will be interred at Glenwood Cemetery, Mankato, where Ruth loved to run. Memorial services will also be held at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, Holman, Wisconsin, on October 6th, and at Grace Lutheran Church, Madison, Wisconsin, on October 19th. May the Lord bless her memory. Your family, and friends, and acquaintances of Ruth, especially you, Ted and Diane, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The text for our meditation this evening is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Questions. Questions. Life is filled with Question. We want to know. Whether we are young or, or old, we find ourselves 
asking, why this? Why that? When will it happen? Where are we going? And today, facing the reality of Ruth's death, <coughs> we raise the question. Why God? Why now? Why did she have to suffer the way she did? Why did you take her at such a young age? For a moment, let us join with the Apostle Paul and repeat his question. What then shall we say? This was a rhetorical question, for St. Paul knew the answer. In fact, he recorded the answer immediately after he wrote the question. He said, if God is for us, who can be against us? And he wrote earlier, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This was Ruth's favorite passage, and it was the passage that she requested be the text for her funeral sermon. And we know that in all things, God works for the good those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God works for the good. Perhaps if we take a peek back at some of the events in Ruth's brief life, we can see why this was such a meaningful passage for her. Shortly after her second birthday, her father, Reverend John Wilde, died. <clears throat> In time, God provided a stepfather, Yucatan, who later adopted her and made Ruth your own. You, together with Diane, provided a loving, supportive Christian home. In all things, God works for the good. As a child growing up in Escondido, California, she was provided a Christian education at a small Wisconsin Simmons elementary school. Though the soul of her biological father was in heaven, she was happy and healthy. She had parents that loved her and a God in heaven who provided for all her physical and spiritual needs. In all things, God works for the good. At the beginning of seventh grade, she moved to Iowa. And there her skills as a church musician really began to flourish. Experts tell us that moves at that age are hard on kids. But for Ruth, the move brought her closer to relatives and closer to where she would one day go to high school and college. All things. God works for the good. During junior high and high school, she became so accomplished as a church musician that she not only began to play hymns in church, but the other parts of the liturgy and preludes and postludes. She was asked to play for weddings and funerals. Her home was in a small town, but she was given some outstanding music teachers that pushed her to excel and to be a blessing to others. And all the while, she had parents who knew the will of God and who made the most of every opportunity to teach their daughter about the free gift of salvation in Christ Jesus. In all things, God works for the good. Finally, the day came when she would come to Bethany as a full-time student. Bethany was a place she had been to often with all the connections that you two had here. And one was hard pressed to not find Ruth smiling and happy. She was in choir and theater and everything musical, and that's how she met Paul. In all things, God works 
in her junior year of college, January of 2009, Ruth began playing organ here at Mount Hall. And by the beginning of her senior year, she was also directing our senior choir. One could easily see how God had prepared her her whole life to be so heavily involved in a music program in one of the largest churches of the city. As I would work on sermons here on Saturday afternoons, I would often hear Ruth playing at that very bench, also practicing. Just think of all those hours upon hours in solitude, practicing, where she could herself meditate on all those rich texts in order to be a blessing to us bringing God's word to us in music and him. In all things, God works to be good. In the summer of 2010, she was married and God blessed she and you, Paul, with pregnancy in the summer of 2011. I remember one Sunday morning she played. During the sermon, she went to go through a while. It's not what you're thinking. She went to do it for a while. By the end of the sermon, though, she was back at the bench to lead us in music once again. I think it was that when she couldn't physically make it through a service that she feared it was time to be assertive with the doctor that it might be more than morning sickness. all things. God works for the good. Cancer was detected. And had it begun its deadly march much earlier, of course any children would not have been possible. The cancer was spreading. But it was caught soon enough that the hospital staff could do everything in their power to both keep the cancer at bay and preserve young John's life. In all things, God works for the good. You, Diana, on Saturday night told me that Ruth got to be and to do all the things she ever wanted. She got to play music to God's glory, she got to come to Bethany. She got to be a wife and a mother. The only thing she really wanted to do that did not come to pass was to be a pastor's wife. But by going out and playing organ at the churches where Paul has conducted services, she even got a little taste of that. God preserved her life just long enough all things. God works for the good. Now Ruth believed that. She could look back at her brief life and she could tell me last Monday, this is the passage I want. I want everyone at this funeral to know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Now, do you survivors and loved ones believe that? Do you believe that in all things, God works for the good? How could Ruth say that? Because she had seen it in her own life. She knew she was a sinner. And she knew how God had worked for the good when it came to her salvation. She sang right along with St. Paul and the hymnist who wrote, Chief of sinners though I be. She confessed, not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul. 
Now what this toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Now what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Ruth derived her joy in life. She was so thankful that God had come to save her. He had worked out all things for her good in providing a loving, faithful mother and a second father to love and care for her when her first father died. He had worked out all things for her good as he granted her happiness and joy in her youth. He had worked out all things for her good as he provided for her during her education and her time at Bethany. He had worked out all things for her good as he provided a husband and a son. Could he not also work out all things for her good when it came to her salvation? Of course. Of course. Ruth had every confidence, based on God's inerrant word, that God had sent his only begotten son into the world for her. Jesus' righteousness was given to her in baptism. Jesus' body and blood, which she received Sunday after Sunday at this communion ring, atoned for her sin. Jesus' perfect life was given to her in a marvelous exchange. Jesus' death on the cross made satisfaction to God for all that she had ever done wrong. Jesus' victory at the empty tomb assured her that she too would be raised in victory. Knowing all that, she could die at peace and in Christ. Before our eyes this evening, Ruth's casket is covered with the funeral pall. It symbolizes how Ruth is clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, covered by the death and resurrection of her Savior. Yes, it still hurts to lose her. She'll be missed. But we shall not grieve as those who have no hope. We won't be shaking our hands. In despair. Why? Because we, like Ruth, believe in the invitation of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. To her family, especially her two brothers, and Diane and Ted. When our son died, my brother in law, and Pastor Russo, and Pastor Eckhoff spoke some words to me that I'll never forget. I pray that these words give comfort to you as well. You have one. Safely home. And to Paul, her husband. Over these months, you've been privileged to witness, first of all, the Christian's proper response to death and dying. And indeed, you have helped Ruth with that. Over the last few days, months really, I've heard innumerable comments on how your and Ruth's faith has strengthened the Christian hope and faith of others. And even more, now that you have, consider it your highest privilege, your highest privilege that you get to preach this good news of the resurrection for the length of your ministry. It will bring comfort not only to others, it will bring comfort to you as well. What then?
shall we say? In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose.
without that, then your mercies cannot be counted. Make us aware of the gravity and uncertainty of human life. Let your Holy Spirit lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days, so that when we shall have served you in our generation, we may be gathered together with those who have gone before us. And in the testimony of a good conscience, in communion with your church, in the comfort of a holy hope, in favor with you, our God, and in peace with all humanity, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Remove our fears and make us bold to pray with confidence as our Savior has taught us.